or what's that called? It's a, yeah, thanks. I thought so. Okay. It's a beautiful piece. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, folks, for being here uh, as we welcome you to our worship. Is there anyone, if there's anyone that's a guest here, we pray we are a special blessing to you. And I always tell people, if we're not, you let us know. We'll try harder next time. So, okay. So, uh, uh, let's stand. Our first song is 583 in the book, if you want to go follow along. But before we do that, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness and mercy in our lives. Thank you for what you've done for us, Lord. Just as we thank you for, uh, think of all the goodness that you've done and the things you've done all week, Lord. We just sometimes, we forget to thank you for the little things that you do. Lord, the protection you give us as we travel, as we move around, the breath you give us to breathe. Lord, we can't even breathe without your help. So, Lord, help us to rely on you. Help us to just always give you the thanks and the glory. Lord, help us to be joyful and praise you, not just today, but every day. And, Lord, just thank you for answering prayer. Uh, this week, bring our pastor home safely as he was in Florida. I give him a safe travel mercies. Thank you, Lord, for the election that happened this week. I pray, Lord, that there wasn't many, we didn't hear many um, problems as far as riots and stuff. We thank you, Lord, for just your hand upon our country. I pray, Lord, as a country, Lord, I pray you just humble our hearts. Lord, help us seek your face and turn from wicked way, Lord, and you tell us you'll heal our lands. I pray, Lord, you'll start a revival in my heart, Lord, and revi start a revival in all our hearts, Lord, that we would just want to serve you and want to glorify you. For, Lord, you're so good. And, Lord, thank you so much for this day. Pray especially for those who are shut-ins and those who are having health issues, can't get out. Pray, Lord, you just be a special blessing to them also today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, 583, you are my all in all. strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up, i be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus, land my shame rising again i bless your name you are my all in all when i fall down you pick me up when i am dry you fill my cup you are my all in all jesus lamb of god song at five uh, 356 redeem if you want to follow along the book redeemed how I love to proclaim it redeemed by the blood of the lamb redeemed through his infinite mercy his child Jesus, no language my rapture can tell. 
this child and forever I am. I think of my blessed Redeemer. I think of him all the day long. I sing for I cannot be silent. His love is a theme of my song. Thankful that should give you a little bit to be thankful for. How about it? <laughs> okay, our next song before they get ready to come pray is uh, 349 Oh, how he loves you and me. Sit down. Great to be here this morning. We are excited to have um, my mic's not on. I think that's me. It's not them. That's me. <laughs> Blame the guy wearing the mic. Well, we have this morning um, a special uh, little kind of blessing going on. We have two blessings. One of them will be in second service. We are privileged to have uh, a baby dedication. That's not what we're doing right now. Is um, Right now, we are honoring Josh Thompson. Um, we had the blessing of a month or so ago having an ordination council with Josh where he sat around the table with, I believe, about 12 men. Um, elders from this church, some other gentlemen from within this church, and a, another pastor uh, from the Church of the Nazarene that we work with, with the Sun Area Work and Witness, and shared his story and his faith and his testimony, his positions on the Word of God. He had to write a whole paper, um, defend some positions that probably most people would sweat a little bit if they had to sit there and kind of give an answer for everything that they believe but he did that with flying colors and stood solidly um, on the Word of God. And here's a picture of that day. Ryan's not in the picture because Ryan took the picture. So, uh, but Ryan was there. And this morning, we wanted to just uh, publicly recognize that with you. Josh, if you'd come forward and uh, just publicly recognize Josh and the ordination uh, with Josh. Josh is already certified. He's already done a couple weddings uh, which has been a huge blessing. And um, where's the certificate at? It's under the pulpit. Are you sure? Oh, it's on the floor. Yeah. I wasn't looking on the floor. 
There's a little nook up here. So Josh said he didn't want a certificate, so we got him one anyway. And um, what Josh said he really wanted, what did you want? I want one of the little trophies with like a person on top. Well, we don't have a person, but we have one with a goat. And if you don't know what GOAT stands for, it's greatest of all time. So it's an acronym. So if you hear the kids say, he's the GOAT. Um, so we did get you a trophy because we didn't want to disrespect your wishes of not wanting a certificate and fail to get you the trophy. And so um, you want to hold that. That's you. We're going to pray over you here. Uh, those who were part elders and uh, those who were part of that, if you'd come up. We're going to have a, a word of prayer over Josh. Malia, if you'd come up too, we'd like to pray over you. Um, and I just wanted to, uh, you know, there's no better truth. There's no better clarity than the Word of God. And um, Paul was writing to uh, young Timothy and gave him a direct charge. And I thought this would be appropriate for you, Josh, and really Malia too. He says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. And so, Josh, may that scripture just be the theme of your ministry and of your life. And uh, church, would you pray with us as we just pray a blessing over Josh and Malia? Great and gracious God, we thank you this morning for the opportunity to uh, bless and honor one of your servants. And I pray today that as we um, lay hands and, and send forth Josh as a servant of yours to do the work here that you have called him to do, that you would just empower him every day. We thank you, Lord, for his faithfulness in the years that he's been here. We thank you for the testimony that he has has gained as he has worked with the youth and, and the young people. And God, I just ask that as the days go forward, that you would continue to lead and guide and direct in his life, that he might grow into greater and, and serve you in ways that maybe he never dreamt he could. Pray for Malia as well and ask, Lord, that you would just... And, Allow her to be encouraged and, and, and hang in there when the times are, are a little bit stressful in and, and, and ministry for Josh, and just pray that you would allow her to be encouraged and, and his support as the days go forward. I thank you, Lord, for the example that he is to each of us, a man willing to step out and serve you. So God, may you be glorified and, and lifted up in all things and through this service, in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much to Brian, the elders, Josh, Malia. We'll have to take that back for second service, but you can hold on to it for now. So, you know, I don't want to just take it off stage, but congratulations. Love you guys. It is, um, I think it's, there's no greater joy than, than seeing someone want to continue to grow in their faith and in their relationship with Jesus Christ, and it really has been a joy um, seeing that in Josh's life. Um, before this morning's sermon, I wanted to take just a minute and kind of update you. We have a, a special meeting or opportunity available coming up November 24th. There will be no adult Sunday school in two weeks. There will be a combined meeting. Now, what's going on in this combined meeting is just an update on the whole building process, where we're at on the buildings. Um, some people have asked, what's the future plan for all the buildings? And so we're going to update you some on what God seems to be doing. We're not saying that he is, um, but it seems that the Lord is doing with some of these buildings. Um, there has been interest expressed, actually, in this church 
by another church to potentially purchase that. And so we want to talk with you about that, discuss it before going any further with you as a congregation. We would also like to discuss a tentative five to ten year plan. I always love making five to ten year plans because about five to ten percent of it comes true. And then the Lord does the other five to ninety-five percent or ninety to ninety-five percent of it, and you just kind of stand back. And scripture says, right, we make the plans, but God directs the steps. And so we do make plans. We have a plan that we'd like to talk with you and hear from you. So plan on that November 24th. I think we're gonna try to have a little more of a thorough building walkthrough. Um, unbelievably, I didn't get to see it this week, but I was told that in the new building, they ha- hung, hang, hung, hung drywall. They started hanging drywall, hunging, hanging. English is a weird language, you know. They hung it, but we're hanging it, right? And it's like, make up your mind. Um, but we really do praise the Lord for what he's doing. And um, Brian shared a really neat testimony before the service of being in a doctor's office and uh, getting to see another person bless people in a doctor's office. You can imagine that, uh, I would imagine that a doctor's office is not always the kindest, calmest, or most loving place to be. And uh, I mention that because I don't always um, share testimony of what the Lord does in ministry. Um, And not because I don't want to, I just don't ever want, there's lots of great testimonies out there. But I had a unique thing happen this week. Um, Any of you ever make an assumption and find out you were wrong? I never ever do that before. Um, Yeah, that happened this week to me. You know, in RC ministry, um, all sorts of people show up, and I never, ever quite seem to know what the Lord's going to do. And the Lord had brought a person that I I presumed was fine. Um, I presumed they were doing good in life. Uh, Every indicator that they gave me on the surface seemed fine. And uh, tragically, this past week in the RC ministry, there was a gentleman who had cerebral palsy, he's been racing with us for more than 10 years, was violently murdered. Um, he's from Johnstown, and uh, I won't even go into the details. I, I literally had never heard of anything like I heard of this week. So suffice it to sh- say, that, that shook some people's lives. Um, he was just here Friday, not this past Friday, the Friday before. And... Um, I was praying for God to open doors to see people get saved and non-believers come to know Christ. It's kind of how I look at RC ministry. The Lord um, gave me a chance to share the gospel many times, but that's not what he affirmed. I had a person come who, like I said, I was a believer, thought they were fine. Um, and in a way, it's interesting, isn't it? We learned that someone's a believer and we often assume they're fine. And he said this to me. He pulled me to the side and he said, you need to know this ministry saved my life. I said, what? And he said, I had nowhere to belong. I had nowhere that I had community. I had nowhere that thought I mattered. And he said, I would have never thought that a toy car God would use to save my life. He said, I wanted to take my life. I thought, you gotta be kidding me. And the reason I open with that is, is, If we're honest, we know that Jesus is so good, and we know that life is eternal. We studied an incredible book that has put magnificent truths in front of us of God's love for us and that we're part of God's family. But it just doesn't seem that life fights fair. It definitely seems the adversary doesn't fight fair and just lets you sit and enjoy that. It seems there's a constant attack, isn't there, to to hear, okay, I'm a child of God, but, but isn't, it, isn't John really saying to us as Christians, if you know you belong, let others know they belong? Right? Isn't that what it's fundamentally getting to, that, that Christ really is saying to us, we're the ambassadors. We can preach the gospel. We can tell people how they can belong to the Lord, but, but if we don't show them, if we don't manifest to them, if we don't make it evident to them, the adversary don't care. The world don't care. They don't fight fair. And when I heard that testimony, it made me think, Lord, in love, how many people in the church that you've allowed me to be a part of, how many other testimonies are there sitting here today that are just not okay? They know the spiritual truths. They know they're a child of God. 
but it doesn't keep depression at bay. I just spent a little bit extra time with my mom down in Florida. Her faith is unwavering. It's unbelievable. And yet, it hurts like crazy to see her husband fall off the rails. And I say all of that because last week in our sermon, we talked about 1 John chapter 5, where he said to us, these things I've written to you that you may know that you have eternal life. And I use that phrase, you got to know that you know that you know. And then in the very next verse, he says that he would like us to have a confidence. And so many times, this confidence that we're to have as believers, are, are, are we bolstering each other's confidence in Christ? Are we questioning each other's confidence in Christ? Are we praying for each other's confidence in Christ? Because this confidence that we're to have, that we know that we have eternal life, why? How can we know that we have eternal life? Did anyone other than me act in a way contrary to eternal life this week? And see, so many times we are fixated, and we should. Our behavior matters. How we live and the holiness that we live with matters. But it is not what determines what we know. What we know is what the Word of God says, because it is always true. It is always valid, and it's, it's a constant, it seems, right? If you, if you were with us in the Spiritual Warfare Sunday School series, you realized that the first question Satan tempted Jesus to question was a question that every single one of us here today are probably faced with the same temptation. Sometimes when the Bible put chapters in, it did an unfortunate thing. The reason it did an unfortunate thing is sometimes we fail to see what happened in chapter three that created chapter four. Do you ever have that happen? Go and read chapter two, but you forget what's in one, but you don't bother to remember what's in one, or you read what's in four. Well, in Luke, Jesus Christ is tempted by the adversary do you remember the first thing Satan questions with him? The very first thing Satan questions is, if you really are the Son of God. I don't know why my computer's talking to me. Kind of weird. But he asks the question. Satan says to him, if you really are the Son of God. Now, why, why in the world would Satan go after that? If you really are the Son of God. Well, lo and behold, right at the end of chapter 3 of Luke, guess what happened to Jesus? He was baptized. Does anyone remember the words that God spoke over his son in that moment in front of everybody? This is my son. How's he finish it? With whom I am well pleased. Was that a truthful statement? Is there anyone that could change it? When God declares it, can anyone change it? So there's God saying to his son, this is my son with whom I, the Lord God, am well pleased. Next chapter, first temptation. So you really think you're the son of God? See, why did Satan ask him that? Because the circumstances of Jesus's life was not matching the circumstances of a king. He was hungry. How many kings do you know that are willing to go 40 days, no food. How, anyone know a king like that? I only know one. His name's Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ, in all of his humanity, the first question he says is, so you really think you're the son of God? So last week, when I say to you, when the word of God says to you, these things I've written to you that you may know, that you know, that you know. How often do we need to be reminded and assured that we know? Constantly. And when I say constantly, I don't mean just in the morning devotions. I mean multiple, multiple, multiple times a day in order to be able to say, we know. We know. You know, this morning you'd walk in, you have a Penn State fan, and you say to him, who won? We know. Right? And probably say it similarly. We know who won. Penn State. We would say these things with gusto. But as believers, 
This morning, as we dive into 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and remind ourselves, where did we come from, that John says, I wrote to you that you may know you have eternal life so that you can have confidence in your relationship with God. And then you say, well, how do I know I have confidence? Remember what he said? We know that we he know that we know he hears us and we know that we have received what we ask. You know, and in this whole world of exaggeration and this whole world of perverse doctrine, there's false doctrine out there, the, the whole name it and claim it and the prosperity gospel, and they kind of ruin it for people because they exaggerate truth. And by exaggerating truth, what many Christians do is when a truth gets exaggerated over here, they go running way over here. They don't come stopping in the middle. And if you have your Bibles and you look at verse 14 and 15, you will see in there, in verse 15, two no statements. I would love for you to turn your Bibles, 1 John chapter 5, verse 15. There's two no statements. What does we know? We know that we have eternal life, verse 13. Verse 15, we know that he hears us. And then it's that last one that we often seem to overlook. We know that we have what we've asked already. When we pray, when we have this assurance, this confidence, this boldness, when we pray for one another, when we make our requests known to God, are we acting presumptuously? Are we arrogant as Christians to pray according to verse 15? To pray knowing that you've already received it, knowing that God hears you. And this is where, again, the whole name it and claim it, and we as believers, I think, have unintentionally given up territory in appropriate confidence in what God's word declares. I mean, he literally tells us, verse 15, and if we, um, and if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked of him. We know so don't believe the lie. Don't believe Satan's tempting lie to go, oh, you're presumptuous. No, we're presumptuous in many ways. I already confessed to you one of the ways that I presumed someone was fine, or I presumed that I knew what someone was thinking. I don't know those things. And it's interesting to me how the Bible tells us things that we can know, and we seem to hold those lightly, and then the things that the Bible says, but you don't know that, we tend to grab tightly to those things. And he tells us there in John that, a confident believer who loves the Lord, who knows they have eternal life, have, have a particular heart for believers. They love other Christians. They love other Christians so much that when they see another Christian sinning, remember that verse, if anyone sees his brother committing a sin, which one, good news, that tells you right in the Bible, do Christians sin? Yes, so that whole nonsense of exaggerative, like, well, Christians don't sin. Well, it's right there. If anyone sees his brother sinning of sin, what are we as Christians to do? Talk about him, berate him, taunt him? No, you're to pray for him. He shall ask. We shall ask, and the Lord will give him life. And so that brings us up to verse 18 of what this week we can know, that we no. If I last week asked you, what do you know? I ask you the same thing. Seriously, what are you assured of today? What are you, what are you just dead set convinced based on the actions of your life? What do you know? Do you know you're going to lunch? How many of us have made lunch plans? We're having life group. So there's a part of me that would say, I know we're having life group. I've made plans accordingly. Dishes are done. Things are put away that aren't normally put away, right? Things are in order that maybe perhaps Monday through Saturday aren't put in order. So there's evidence in my house that would say, does Aaron and Nicole and his family know that they're having life group? Yes. What types of things have you done to show what you know? Would you say that I'm arrogant that I prepared our house to get ready for life group, would you say, oh my, he's arrogant. Why do we apply that same thing to spiritual things when a believer says, I know? It's not arrogance. 
It's evidence of the reality of God in their life. And John apparently wants his church to know because back in 13, he says, I wrote to you so that you may know. 15, he says, you know that he hears you. You know that you've received it. And here again in verse 18, he says, once again, we know. It's not arrogant. But are we as believers allowing ourselves to be trampled down? Are we giving up a biblical Christ-centered confidence in the name of false humility. We, we, we sometimes, I believe, act so humble and meek and mild about things that we ought not to be humble, meek, and mild about. And then the things that we ought not be fired up about, we're fired up about. And so John is saying to his church, church, you know that everyone, and when he talks about everyone in this context, he's saying every believer, you know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning. Full stop. Well, not a full stop, but that's where we're going to stop for now. And this statement, John has already made it previously back in 1 John chapter 3, verse 9, where he says, no one born of God makes a practice of sinning. For God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this, it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. And here, John has very clearly in mind that he says, you know that every Christian who has truly been born again who is truly a child of God, does not keep on sinning. Now, here's the thing with this phrase. In the Greek, the English gives you some slack. It puts the phrase in there, does not keep on sinning. In the Greek, it literally says, we know that all those who are born of God do not sin. Now, it's really pungent, right? And some might hear that and go, I sinned. You, you just said back in the verse 14 that if we see a brother sinning, now he's saying here Christians can't sin. Ah, which is it? Context, context, context. John already told us back in 1 John chapter 1. You remember when he said to you, if you say you have not sinned, you make God a liar? Remember that one? So clearly this statement cannot mean a statement of totally devoid and perfect in every way, never, ever, never sinning. No. Clearly this present tense born of God does not keep on sinning, is the reality that sin is supposed to be incompatible in a Christian's life. Sin is to be totally incompatible. But why is it, why is it that we as believers still battle sin? Because we got this little thing called flesh. It likes it. It's its natural resting state. Do you ever notice that? That if you're not trying, if you're just kind of there, do you ever have one of those moments where you're trying to relax and someone, sometimes a little one, could sometimes be a big one, come and, and pesters you? Do you ever notice that the fruit of the Spirit is not the default thing? Do you ever notice that? They're pestering you, they're picking you. Do you ever notice that the first response is not Yes, my love, how may I bless you? You ever notice that? And yet Jesus says what? Those who pester you, you are to bless them. I mean, he says it worse than that. Those who curse you, may you bless them. So we, we seem as Christians to be aware of the fact that we are indeed born again. And the very fact that we as Christians care that we sin, I believe is one of the primary evidences of the Holy Spirit in a person's life, that we care that we sin. And then on top of that, not only do we care that we sin, but we take actual steps to repent of sin. Now, this is why we as believers, and I've talked to you about this before, why I say to you as Christians, we must be careful that we do not become addicted to the feeling bad about sin, and therefore then we feel good. Well, I felt bad about it. You know, did you gossip about them? I did. I shouldn't have, but I feel bad about it. Well, have you taken action steps to not do it again? No, no, I just feel bad about it. And this is the very thing, that type of attitude, the hyper-spiritual attitude that says, I mean, I know I shouldn't have done it. I just feel really bad that I did it. 
So are you going to stop doing it? Well, I mean, I think so. But what are you going to do to stop doing it? I'm not sure. I just know I'm not supposed to. So I feel really bad about that. And I think God likes a broken and contrite heart, right? So, I mean, I'm doing good, aren't I? Here, John's saying, absolutely not. It is not enough for a Christian to feel bad about the sin in their life. What he's saying to his church is, do you understand the black and white statement that I'm making? A born again child of God, all those who have been born of God don't sin. A Christian recognizes and fully accepts sin and Christians don't mix. Why? Because our Savior paid it all. Our Savior put a new heart in us that not only did he forgive us, not only did he put us into a perfect marital union with him where he is our eternal husband, and he says that anything that takes priority over him is adultery. You may say, well, where does he say that, Aaron? The book of James, chapter four, that says, don't you know that friendship with the world is enmity with God, and don't you know that if you want to be friends with the world... And you remember how he opens that verse? He says, you adulterers. It's a relational language. And here John is saying to his church, church, don't don't just fall into this hyper-spiritualism. This is the very thing that John was teaching against, a very kind of hyperistic spiritualism. A spiritualism that the Jews fell into and the way the Jews tried to solve their spiritualism was legalism. And sometimes we don't look at legalism as a bad thing, but legalism is a bad thing because when you add to the commandments of God, here's what I will assure you, you'll miss the actual commandments. Jesus taught that very clearly with the disciples where he said to them, hey, these Pharisees, keep, they try to keep the law. Meanwhile, they fail to love people. And so Christian, have you allowed and have we allowed sin to become a normal condition in our lives. And you may say, well, Aaron, what is sin? I'm going to define sin as anything that does not match the character of Christ. And you may say, well, why does that matter, Aaron? Why, Why not use the law? Well, we could use the law and we would all stand incredibly guilty But when I say using the character of Christ as the measure of sin, that comes primarily from Philippians 2, where the Apostle Paul says, have this mind in you, which is in Christ Jesus. He says very clearly that there he's saying, I'm not really talking per se about action. I'm talking about heart and attitude. And see, what God came to do is he came to change hearts, amen? came to change my heart. He came to change your heart. And a heart that doesn't just not do sinful things because I don't want to look bad or I'm worried what other people will think or I'm scared of being caught, but I don't do sinful things because I'm a child of God. And I'm so much so a child of God that I want my life to reflect the child of God, Jesus Christ. And so in a society that has become so tolerant, a society that in some ways has become so evil that we as Christians basically say, I'm just glad I'm not as evil as them. Do you ever see that happen with Christians? Where they'll hear about transgenders or they'll hear about homosexuals or they'll hear about drunks and drug addicts and they'll go, I'm just glad I'm not as bad as them. Meanwhile, we fail in the lesser things that John already talked to us about. Remember back in John 3 where he says, Don't you know that to not love your brother is to abide in death? John literally tells Christians, okay, great. I'm so glad that God has changed your lives, that you're not homosexuals and that you're not getting divorced every second and that you're not greedy and you're not constantly telling lies. But fundamentally, what does John come back to? What is John's focal point? What has been his focal point? Love each other. And fundamentally, what he's asking his church is, Everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, a.k.a. do you love everyone that calls themselves a believer? See, to be able to actually love one another genuinely and authentically, you're going to have to make a choice. 
And that choice is going to boil down to this. Jesus has to be enough. Why do I love you? Is it because we treat each other so lovingly all the time? Is it because we're so radically committed to make sure that not one corrupt word proceeds out of our mouth, but only what's necessary for building up? Let's all, let's all play the real game here. We know that's not true. Anyone other than me notice how easy it is to let one corrupt word, a word that tears somebody down, come out of their mouth? Do you ever notice how easy that is? And so do we love each other because of how we treat each other? No, that's worldly. That's a godless way of thinking. The God's way of thinking is we love each other. Why? Because of the love that's been shown towards us. What kind of love was shown towards us? In that while we were yet sinners, love was displayed. Isn't that good news? You know, sometimes in the office, I'll joke with the staff, isn't it good news that I don't love you because I want to? I love you because I got to. That's good news. Because if, if my love for the staff and for you was t- contingent on loving you when I wanted to, I, I don't want to paint too grim of a picture of myself here, but let's, I'm going to be honest. I mean, you, I, I won't get too deep into my marriage, but man, oh day, Nicole's a target in that way of thinking too. And so we as believers must commit to this reality that sin is not compatible with our lives and we need to stop looking at what we deem as the big stuff and focus on the things that First John says that says, look, as Christians, if you're out there blatantly sinning, that, that's a whole other discussion of another book. And there's other verses of Scripture that talk about what do you do with sinners or Christians who blatantly sin? First Corinthians 5, you hand them over to Satan for the destruction of their flesh so that their soul can be saved. If you're out there blatantly sinning, you're toying with the idea that somehow a righteous God is just going to ignore your sinfulness. In fact, our God, as we talked last week, takes sin so seriously that there is sin that he will actually carry out physical death for. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, why did many Christians in the church of Corinth sleep or die? Because they made a joke about communion. And so church, we, we need to let this truth just settle deep within and say, Lord, Right? This is why David says things to God like, search me and try me, and if you find any wayward way in me. But the thing is, if God is not all loving and all gracious and all merciful, we will not have the vulnerability or the trust to be able to say to God, anything, anything that is not of the standard of Christ in my life, point it out. Because when you pray that, what you're opening yourself up to is, God may use other believers to point it out. Anyone other than me ever get a little defensive when a, when a friend or a spouse or someone close to me points something out in your life? You know what my defensiveness says? I don't trust in the grace of God. My defensiveness will often say, I trust in my reputation or my integrity. When ultimately, what am I to put my trust in? The gospel, the loving Jesus Christ, Savior of the world. And so John says, I need you to know, church, you've got to know this, that sin is incompatible. And then we get into a really nixy, tricksy part of the verse, right in the middle. But he who was born of God protects him. Now, if you have a King James Bible, this line right here is going to be a little different in your Bible, and it's going to be particularly different around this word. Do you notice it? If you have your King James Bible, do you see it? It says in your Bible, the one born of God protects himself, doesn't it? My King James friends. That middle section, verse 18, says that he protects himself. And man, oh day, this is a tricky little part of the verse because one, you could take this part to say, but he who was born of God, and you could take that statement to be Jesus, the challenge with taking that phrase, but he who was born of God has not in the whole letter been used to speak of Jesus. That wording has only been used to speak of Christians, those who are born of God. And he just used it in the previous sentence. We know that everyone who has been born of God, and so why, because, and then you got people that argue and say, well, Christians can't protect themselves, right? But he who was born of God protects himself. And it's like, well, 
Time out. Time out. Spiritually speaking, who is our protector? Jesus Christ, the righteous one, right? John already told us that back in 1 John chapter 2, right? I wrote these things to you that you might not sin, but when you sin, you have an advocate in Jesus Christ. So we know as Christians, spiritually speaking, I can't protect myself. I need the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ to protect me. Simultaneously though, because that sounds a little bit like hyper-spiritualism, is there not things that the Word of God teaches Christians to do so that they won't sin? What do you think? Right? One of the fundamental commandments that I teach my kids, and I love to teach young people, is there is one sin in particular that God says this, don't ever think you're tough enough to mess around with it. When it comes around, run from it. You know what that sin is? Sexual immorality. You look at all the great men of the Bible, what, what sin brought them all down? Sexual immorality. So if I'm going to protect myself, if it's valid to say, can a believer appropriately protect themselves? Is there things that John has told us as Christians that we could do to actually protect ourselves, reasonably speaking? Absolutely. Fundamentally, if we love each other and we see other believers sin, back in verse 14, 15, here the believer who sees that brother sin is going, Lord, I don't judge him. I don't drop the hammer on him, but I also don't accept his sin. So first and foremost, I'm going to pray for his sin. I'm going to pray for him and trust that you, the Lord God, will give him life. But I'm also going to stand in the gap. I am going to be an intercessory prayer. How many of you, and don't raise your hand to this, but how many of you love intercessory prayer? I do. I love, one of my favorite things to do is to pray over you. I can't pray over all of you every day. That's not how I do it. The only way I know how to pray for this many people is I break you into sevens. And on my phone, I have a program called OneNote, and it breaks the entire church into sevens. One group gets paid for Monday, another group gets paid for Tuesday. I have no other systematic way to actually authentically intercede on your behalf. What do I intercede for? Do 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 I pray for good health and prosperity? Sure I do. John prays that same thing, but I also pray, God, it's so easy to forget where our help comes from. It's so easy to walk arrogantly through this life. How do I know that? Because, Lord, I do it. And so I pray over my church family that they would walk in faithfulness, but know above all things, when they fail, Jesus is right there. May they remember that the Lord did not come to the world to condemn the world, but to remember Jesus Christ came to be their Savior and friend, not their enemy. Why do I pray those things? Because the enemy is pretty effective. Remember the first question he asked Jesus? So you really think you're the Son of God? Has no one other than me this week faced a challenge that they failed at? And the first tempting thought you heard was, so you really say you're a child of God? If you're a child of God, why is your dad dying? You're a child of God, why is life so hard? You think we're free of these things? I know I'm not. Therefore, I assume lovingly, you're not. So I intercede for you. Not because I'm anything great, but I take the word of God seriously that says, Aaron, pray knowing that he hears you and pray knowing that you've already received it. Because here's the fundamental reality I know more than anything. God cares for you more than any other human being ever could. And so this verse that says, but he who was born of God protects him. One, it is true that Jesus protects us. Jesus, this statement could apply to Jesus and be 100% valid. Jesus is our guardian. He is our protector. He says things to us like, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Hallelujah, praise God. Fundamentally though, also we as Christians are to pray for each other, to stand in the gap of one another. For, uh, Ephesians 6, 18, the final piece of the armor of God in the territory of spiritual warfare is to Pray at all times in the Spirit. And so we as believers have this opportunity to pray because if you take verses 14 and 15 seriously, you see a brother sin, what are you to do? Pray. Church, for some reason, there seems to be, and I'm not saying you have it, but I've had it, there's a cynicism about prayer. And the cynicism about prayer says this, God already knows what he's going to do, so why do I need to ask? 
And yet, 1 John says explicitly, when you see another Christian sin, you've got to pray. And what's the promise? God will give life. So what's Satan do? He gets in the mix of it and goes, ah, he already knows what he's going to do. Don't ask. And then we wonder, why aren't Christians recovering? Why aren't Christians coming out of sin? Because the formula of the word of God that we know is he hears us and he will give life. But what do you have to do? You have to ask. And this is where I, 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 I would say it to Josh, I would say it to Ryan, I would say it to the elders, and I would say it to every person in this world, there will never be a lack of busy things for you to do. There will never be a lack of ministry. But I assure you of this, there will always be an attack on prayer time and intimacy with God, always. You have to make that happen. I'll never run out of visits to do. I'll never run out of sermons to prepare. I'll never run out of lessons to teach. I'll never run out of counseling opportunities. Never. And fundamentally, what am I to do for this church? If I see someone sin, the first thing John says is, pray for him first, Aaron. Why do I pray for him first? It keeps arrogance out of my heart. It keeps us from thinking, well, I'm just glad I didn't do that. You fool. You've done it. You just don't see how you've done it. Did you do the exact same act? No, that's what the Pharisees did. I never slept with her. What's Jesus say? But you looked at her with lust. There's no difference. I never actually raised the knife to murder him. What's he say in 1 John? But you didn't love him? You, well, I mean, I didn't love him, but at least I didn't kill him. And Jesus says what? But you, so you abide in death. You abide in death. And so we as believers are called to act as protectors for one another while realizing Jesus Christ is the protector. Then in the moments that we fail to pray as we ought, fail to live as we ought, fail to do as we ought, we have a better protector than any of us, and his name is Jesus Christ, the one who says, and lo, I am with you always. The one who says in Hebrews 13, I will never, ever leave you or forsake you. And so don't wear this bondage badge that's like, well, I didn't pray enough. No kidding. <laughs> Join the party. Okay, the disciples on the night Jesus was betrayed was asked to keep watch and pray. What did they do instead? What we all do, sleep. Sleep. And then John gives this promise and the evil one does not touch him. This idea of touch does not mean, it can't mean Touch, because if, again, if you were in the spiritual warfare conversation, remember when we looked at the life of Jesus Christ, how much influence did Satan have over Jesus? A lot. If you haven't read The Temptation of Jesus recently, go back and read it. What did Satan do to Jesus? It says in the scripture, he picked him up and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple. Jesus didn't get there himself. He's a human being. He can't fly. So Satan clearly can't mean that he can't touch you because he touched Jesus and lifted him. On top of that, when Jesus was standing at the top of the mount, it says that he had a vision from Satan of all the kingdoms in the world at a moment of time. That was part of the temptation, remember? Jesus was saying, I'll give you all these kingdoms. And he showed him, Satan showed him all these kingdoms. So that means that there can be this possibility of actual demonic vision to lie to us. And so this promise of do not touch him comes first from the condition of verse 18 at the beginning. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning. We know that the word of God says, look, when you let anger hang out in your life, you give Satan a foothold. We know the scripture says that. We know that Jesus Christ said to his own friend and disciple, Peter, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. This lines up perfectly. You know what Jesus did right after he said that to him? But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when, see there Jesus, he's praying like he's already received it. And when you have turned again. Right there is 1 John. Pray knowing that he hears you. Pray knowing that you've received it. Jesus Christ just spoke 1 John to us in practical wisdom. Peter, Satan's gonna come after you. Here's the good news. So that touch can't mean like two kids in the back seat of the car. Not that anyone's kids other than mine ever did this. He touched me. It's like he literally, literally like grazed your arm. Like calm down. Ugh, get off me. Okay? Literally, that could be the, the line. It's not that. It's the idea of 
taking hold of, grasping. So in the context of Peter, did Satan have him? Yeah, he had him. But did he have him? No. And that means that part of Peter's denial was what? Satanically influenced. Plus, anyone other than me, after you not deny Jesus one time, anyone other than me going to dig a pit and climb into it and fall into the second one? You moron. You remember when Jesus told you you were going to deny him? Look at you. You already did it. And that pit of despair leads to another pit, and that pit of despair leads to another pit. And so what John's saying here is a fundamental promise of church. When we walk in holiness, when we walk in obedience, when we walk in agreement with what God says about us, there is a protection that comes through Jesus Christ, and there is a protection that comes. Because if we're walking in obedience, what are we doing? We're praying for each other. Why? Because the Word of God says this is what Christians do. And when we walk in this life, Satan cannot hold you. He cannot have you. He cannot grasp you. But it certainly doesn't mean that he can't influence or antagonize or weaponize against us. But we can take heart in knowing you could never, ever be his again. But unfortunately, it seems that we're living in a time where far too many Christians have become far too comfortable in sin. And we have settled and said, well, at least I'm not doing the big stuff. We're going to have to finish this in two weeks. Next week, Josh is going to preach. I'm excited about that. You know, many of us in today's day and age, we would think, what warning would John give his church for the big stuff the church needs to watch out for? No homosexuality. No, watch out for abortion. They're all big deals, and I'm not trying to make light of them. But do you know the closing warning that John says to his church? Keep yourself free from idols. There's a song out there that says, what's an idol? Anything I put before my God is an idol. That's an idol. And we can get caught up in not doing the big stuff, and I praise God we're not. I don't mean to diminish it. I want to celebrate it and thank God that he has made us holy. But when we compare ourselves to others and not to Christ, we're falling in a trap and we don't see it. And I don't know about you, but one of the things my flesh is a professional at is making allowances for Aaron Benner. I am a professional excuse maker for why things should go my way, of why I should be allowed to put my stuff before others. Isn't it a genius move that verse 21, John gives his precious church that final warning, children, my loved ones, Watch out for idols. It's probably, some would argue, it is probably the number one thing we struggle with. And that primary idol that we put first is ourselves. I once heard on that closing, uh, it's not our closing hymn. I guess it could be. No, this one's good enough too. But it just came to my mind, that song, On Christ the Solid Rock I Stand. All other ground is sinking sand. I once heard an old-time preacher say, do you know what that other ground is? It's you. It's you. It's your excuses, your interests, your hobbies, your wants, your desires, your thoughts, your truths. And just letting that word of God, church, a sermon like this, my hope and prayer is that what it will move us to is authentic prayer for each other, love, lovingly. That as we pray for our faithfulness and our strength, just like Jesus said to Peter, Peter, Satan demand to have you. That's gonna happen sometimes. Not much we can do to stop that, but here's what I can do. I can pray that your faith wouldn't fail. I've often said in elder meeting that one of the worst things that could happen is someone could be healed of a physical infirmity but fail in their faith. We live in a world that seems to like show and glitz and, oh, I, can you imagine if the blind could see? Well, that's all fine and good if the blind can see, but it does no good if their soul can't see Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That just means they're going to hell with eyes. 
And we gotta, we got to keep the focus, the focus of the gospel of Jesus Christ for each other so that we can live lives of appropriate confidence that we know, that we know, that we know. And that when we see each other sin or we see someone do something stupid, rather than go, wow, well, that's really stupid, we go, Lord, I realize how good I am at being stupid. And when I'm stupid, do you know what I do? I pray. Do you know what I'm going to do for my brother? I'm going to pray. That way they can know that they know that they know. That they have eternal life. They can know that God's a life giver, not a life taker. And that we can know that we walk with him. Heavenly Father, this morning as we unpack a a really beautiful, truthful, loving, gracious, Jesus-centered, life-giving, spirit-giving verse... Lord, I'm so grateful for this book of 1 John and the way that you've used it in my life, and I am confident that those who are here today would say, Lord, thank you for using your word to transform my life. And Lord, I pray that today, if there's any believer that has walked in with sin, perhaps it's a persistent sin, perhaps it has been a nagging sin, I pray that they would not give up hope, but rather than try to deal with it on their own, that they would do as Scripture prescribes, and they would allow another believer to bear that burden with them. Lord, our arrogance so regularly wants to deal with our sin on our own, and Lord, I've come to the firm realization that there is great strength in fellowship with people who love you and love me and love each other. And allow them to pray, allow them to ask hard questions, allow them to remind us, remind me of the gospel truth that I don't have to give in to sin. I don't have to do that anymore because the fact of the matter is we really are your children and you really have given us a way of escape. But Lord, when we hide it, when we conceal it, when we diminish it, We fail to see your power and we fail to see your goodness. And when we fail to see our good, your goodness, and when we fail to walk in freedom from sin, one of the most assured outcomes, Lord, is then we stop praying because if you can't, if you can't get us out of this sin, how are you going to get someone else out of this sin? So what's the point in praying? And I've prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. But Lord, may we see that we may pray, but you still ask us to walk in obedience, to do it your way. In fact, the book of James, you teach us, Lord, that if anyone needs healed, let us confess to one another. And for some people, Lord, to confess a sin to anyone else is absolutely, it's mortifying, it's soul crushing, and yet it's your word that says, mortify the flesh, put it to death, let it die. And so, Lord, I pray over the church today that even if there's just one brother or sister that has something that they just want rid of, that it's been around far too long and they've made far too many excuses, I I pray today would be the day of repentance, that they would take the actual steps, not just feel the guilt or the shame or the despair or the feeling bad about it and then feeling good that they feel bad, but they would actually do something something different, something biblical, something Christ-like to overcome their sin. And Lord, may we pray for one another. May we, when we hear of others' failures, may we sincerely pray with compassion, with hearts sympathetic but not tolerant. It says, I know how hard sin can be, and so I pray. And so Lord, may your word, may your testimony and may your spirit strengthen your people. And for those who are walking in holiness, for those who just shout a hearty amen, that Jesus is the victory, that he can overcome. I I pray that they would make their lives available to help other believers walk in freedom. That we wouldn't take for granted these promises that we know that those who are born of God do not sin. Lord, may we not make any allowance 
May we not make any allowance for sin in our life. And may we do it all for you, not not for the fear of what others would say or think. May we do it because we see and revere your word and we revere you and what you say. And that what you say is more true than what we feel and what we think and what we want because you, you, the Lord God, are truth. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. Thank you, Pastor. Our last song is going to be 353, Victory in Jesus. If you want to follow along the book, would you please stand as we sing? I heard an old, old story, how a Savior came from glory, how he gave us life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood atoning. Then I repented of my sin and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing, how he made the lame to walk again and cause the blind to see. And then I cry, dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. About the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea, about the angels singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior. Sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. That don't get your blood boiling, nothing doesn't. Uh, just one thing to ponder as pastors preaching there. I was thinking, uh, for me as well as for you, I was thinking, are we drawing closer to Jesus every day? Are we being more like Christ? That should be our goal in life, to be more like him. So have an awesome day. You're dismissed.